Okay, I uh, appreciate you guys um, you know, bearing with me while I'm out of town uh, so that we can still have class. Uh, I'll be virtually using uh, our normal Twitter discussion and then the delivery of today's lecture using uh, this video that you downloaded. Uh, first off, I just wanted to go over a couple of reminders that are more nuts and bolts things related to the class. And then we'll begin the lecture on Proto-SF uh, and uh, more specifically on H.G. Wells and uh, E.M. Forster. So a few reminders first uh, regarding Twitter. Uh, so remember, everybody needs to have 10 tweets per week at least. That's six observation links, background research types of uh, tweets. Uh, two questions about the readings or the lecture, and two responses to the questions of others. So make sure that you're following one another, and you'll want to try to you know, connect with other people when you're responding to questions. Uh, don't feel uh, if one person has already responded to a question that you're not allowed to also respond. So you can respond to uh, the same question that other people might have responded to, but also try to respond to the questions of people you haven't yet responded to. You want to try to meet some of these people in the class uh, by using Twitter as a discussion medium. Uh, so again, make sure you're following everybody in class. And there's a couple of folks that, uh, for whatever reason, your Twitter accounts uh, are, are marked as private or locked. Make sure that you turn uh, your privacy settings to public. Uh, if you're not comfortable doing that, again, as I've said in the very first lecture, you can create a uh, pseudonymous account uh, that you just make up a name and you just use it for our class. Uh, but just make sure you let me know what that account is and uh, so that I'll add it to my list of accounts for the class and we'll get the word out to everybody else in class to follow you. Um, and again, uh, you can do that uh, by you know, connecting to me on Twitter uh, by sending me that introductory tweet to add dynamic subspace. Um, then for those of you who joined the class a little bit late, uh, make sure that by the end of the third week you should have at least a total of 30 tweets relating to uh, our readings and also the lecture in class. You can have more, uh, but now's the time to catch up so that moving forward you'll always be hitting at least 10 tweets per week. Now I would encourage you to do more than that uh, but the requirement, uh, the minimal requirement, is 10 tweets per week. And then I have two special assignments for everybody uh, involving Twitter. First off, uh, I'd like um, two of your six observation tweets for this week to identify the definition or definitions from our list of um, uh, science fiction definitions that I gave you. Um, which of those best describes the Wells story, the star, and Ian Forster's The Machine Stops? These are two very different kinds of stories. So I'm curious to see like, which of uh, those definitions that you have access to uh, you know, fits with these stories that we read uh, for Wednesday's class. And uh, then secondly, I want everybody to complete their profiles. You know, put up a picture. It doesn't have to be a picture of you. It could be a picture of something science fictional. Uh, it could be a picture that you like. It could be a picture you've taken. It could be a picture you found online. But give your account a picture. Uh, and then also complete the profile uh, section of your account where you can have up to 140 characters to say something about yourself. It could be a list of the favorite science fiction films or video games or books that you like. It could be what your major is at tech. It could say something about what the kinds of work you do at tech. Whatever you want to, to say about yourself or about yourself in relationship to the account you're using with our class, complete that profile section. And then again, make sure your account is, is uh, unlocked and marked as public so that everybody has access uh, to the things that you're saying and that we can also engage um, the words of others who are not in our class. So one of the cool things that have been happening uh, in these first few weeks is I've already had some of my colleagues at Georgia Tech to respond to uh, some of your tweets and also colleagues who uh, also study science fiction but work at other places uh, around the United States have been um, ringing in on some of your tweets and offering other suggestions, comments, uh, readings, etc. Um, so if your account's not marked as public then you're not able to fully engage in that way. And again you don't have to have your real name on the account if you don't want um, but just make sure you let me know uh, that association so that I can uh, keep track of the tweets that you're making now and then when you turn everything in at the very end of the semester. If you have any questions about any of that, 
don't hesitate to send me an email. Um, you know, it's uh, jason.ellis at lmc.gotech.edu. Uh, or you can also send me a direct message on um, uh, Twitter at Dynamic Subspace. Okay, so with that, uh, let's turn over to uh, the proto science fiction notes uh, for today's class and some background that I want you guys to know uh, in relation to the early development of science fiction uh, that led up to uh, just before there was a more formal definition of what science fiction is. And uh, just another um, thing I should say, I apologize for, for uh, the way I sound. Uh, my allergies are acting up really badly today, so if I'm sniffly or nasally, that's the reason why. And, you know, uh, I apologize for that, but hopefully everything will come through the microphone uh, well enough that you'll be able to uh, follow along. And, of course, with this video, uh, you can pause, rewind, etc. Now, one thing that you might need to do, because uh, I'm recording this at home, I don't have access to a tablet to write with, is that you might need to look up some of these names uh, or dates or some, some things that you might have trouble uh, just taking from my oral lecture and putting into your notes. Uh, so you, the, as with everything in the class, there is a certain expectation that you might have to uh, do a little bit of background work on your own in order to fill out the notes that I give you in lecture. Uh, so that whenever you write your discussion essays, which we'll go over when we are all back together um, the week after next, um, I'll talk a little bit more about those discussion essays that we have in lieu of exams in the class. All right, so let's begin uh, the lecture on today's um, topic, which is Proto-SF. Okay, so looking backwards, we can identify Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as the first science fiction novel because it is the first strong example to turn on the techno-scientific question and have characters that embody and critique the scientific and enlightenment attitudes of the author's time. Remember, for example, Victor chooses science over alchemy. That's the first time uh, that choice was made in a work of uh, a, a popular fiction. Now, there are a few things that had to happen before works that we would describe as science fiction could be created. First, there's a cognitive and scientific view of the world that emerged in the 17th century, but it took until the 18th and 19th centuries to filter into society. So, as I mentioned in, in lecture before, Mary Shelley, for example, had, uh, was, had access to education, she had access to some of the leading minds of her time um, through her, her friends and, and family associations. And that gave her uh, a tremendous advantage when it comes to formulating the kind of story that we have in Frankenstein. Many of the things that uh, you know, we might take for granted that she talks about in Frankenstein, it took a long time to filter out into society at large. So that's the first thing. The second is that social revolutions of the late 18th century demonstrated that social structures are fragile and have a potential for change. And one of the things that you probably noticed on many of those definitions of science fiction is this aspect of social change uh, that comes as a result of science and technology. That's not just that the story needs to have a strong aspect of science and technology, but the story needs to extrapolate Based on that change, what would happen to people? What would happen to our social structures? What would happen to our government? All of these types of issues um, are explored in what we think of as the, you know, the strongest examples of science fiction. Now, for modern science fiction to emerge, we needed five different elements to come together. And some of these I've talked about a little bit, but I'm going to talk about them now in terms of uh, how we would categorize them. So the first um, element that needed to take place was the development of the fantastic voyage. The first is the fantastic voyage. Examples of this, which I mentioned in my last lecture, include the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is like the very, very earliest beginnings of anything remotely resembling science fiction. We have Homer's Odyssey about Odysseus. Uh, we have Cyrano de Bergerac's Other Worlds, uh, we have Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, which I mentioned before. So these are just some examples that you can have in mind. The second thing that needed to, to, to emerge 
is the utopia. The utopia, which I've talked a lot about in, in a previous lecture. So with the utopia, we have Thomas More's utopia. And again, uh, just to, to reiterate some of the things I said before, is that the name utopia derives from utopia, meaning no place, or utopia, meaning a good place. That is kind of a punning title that it could mean both things simultaneously. Um, and in modern usage, it can be both things, that it could be no place, or it could be a good place, or it could be a mixture of both of those. And then from this initial uh, idea of a utopia, this, this perf perfected society, is uh, different types of them. So we have the utopia, which is the ideal place. Uh, then we have dystopias, which are really bad places. And we also have heterotopias, which are kind of a mixture of utopia and dystopian elements, or a mixture of utopian societies next to dystopian societies. And one of the examples I mentioned in a previous class was Marge Piercy's He, She, and It, a really great novel. Unfortunately, we don't have time to, to read it in our class, but if you're really interested in Frankenstein um, and you want to do more with the themes of Frankenstein in your final uh, research paper in the class, you might pick up a copy of He, She, and It and read that for your final paper because it is a very rich text, uh, it's a very good story, uh, and explores Frankenstein uh, from a more modern perspective. But it brings in some other ideas that are also very old uh, in regards to the Gollum. Uh, not the Gollum, but uh, um, the, the idea of um, artificial creation uh, in relation to um, uh, uh, religion, and the word that I'm looking for is the golem. Uh, of course, I was thinking of uh, uh, Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings trilogy and Gollum, but totally different concept, totally different character. What I was trying to say is the golem. Um, so look that up if you're interested in those things, and you can ask me more about he, she, and it uh, during class or over Twitter. So the first two things are the Fantastic Voyage and the Utopia. The third is the Conte Philosophique. This is spelled C-O-N-T-E-P-H-I-L-O-S-O-P-H-I-Q-U-E. -E. The Conte Philosophique, the philosophical tale. Um, another way of thinking of the satire. Uh, some examples of you know, who made this a, a very popular uh, genre is Voltaire in France. Um, these types of stories work through contemporary political and philosophical questions through a fictional story. So the fictional story serves as a veil so that they, it makes it safe to discuss philosophical or political questions without necessarily um, being too close to what might make people uncomfortable uh, either for uh, you getting in trouble with the authorities, with the church, uh, uh, etc. So uh, this is another way of thinking of uh, more generally in like a, a popular fiction as a philosophical thought experiment that doesn't involve um, science and technology in the same way that we talk about science fiction. So it's the it's a philosophical thought experiment, um, but involving you know some sort of um, uh, you know, uh, realistic or mundane um, fiction. Now the fourth, which we've talked a little bit about before, is the Gothic. The Gothic, again, is a reaction to enlightenment value of reason. It has romantic or idealizing characteristics. It has a strong element of the mysterious or supernatural. And finally, it usually features the persecution of a woman in an isolated location. But you can think of ways, if we want to think of like Frankenstein as a gothic um, fiction, that it plays on some of these ideas and, and turns them on their head. So instead of um, a woman being persecuted as being a large element of the story, we have Victor Frankenstein being persecuted uh, by his creation. Or we can see the creature being persecuted um, by you know, all the humanity that he encounters uh, because of his unusual appearance. So there's different ways that we can think about how Mary Shelley's playing with these ideas in, in her fiction. And 
the fifth and final thing that needed to come about for a modern sense of science fiction to develop is technological and sociological anticipation. Technological and sociological anticipation. Now, what this involves um, are technical advances in work and daily life. Again, getting back to this idea that these ideas need to filter down into popular um, culture and society. Uh, also, it involved greater access to education. I mean, people needed to know what, what science was about. They needed to know, um, you know what rationality was. They needed access to mathematics. They needed access to these things to open up um, a wider world to them, particularly with literacy, being able to read. And one aspect of the anticipation part comes in a specific genre of story um, that was popular in the United States. And what you'll find is, you know, the way that science fiction solidified is that it didn't solidify as much um, in continental Europe as it did in the United States. And, and one of the ways that this happened was a type of um, fiction that developed largely in the United States called dime novels. Now, these were novels um, that, you, that literally sold for a dime, and they were very popular at the end of the 19th century, and like the, the latter half of the 19th century. Um, they, some could cost less than a dime, maybe five or six cents a piece. Uh, they were printed on very cheap paper, and the type of writing was hack work. I mean, this was just like stories thrown together. Um, the writers were paid uh, by the word, so I mean, they were going to be as verbose as possible, um, trying to make convoluted constructions in order to they get a little bit more money on the writing that they're doing. Uh, this was a popular literature. It was meant to, to be read by the masses, people that, that obviously had literacy, uh, but these you know, weren't people you know, working at you know, a university or college. This was this, the everyday person who had access to some um, uh, reading literacy. There were three types of dime novels. Uh, they were the invention story, stories involving like you creating something that does something really cool. There was the lost race story. These are stories about uh, lost races of humanity that might be living under the earth or living in an isolated part of the Amazon, that sort of thing. And then the Marvel story, something you know, fantastic happens. Um, the first, um, the earliest example of this type of dime novel is a story or novel by Edward S. Ellis. No relation to me. Uh, Edward S. Ellis wrote in 1868, The Steam Man of the Prairies. This example is also called an Edisonade. I'll spell that for you, Edisonade. E-D-I-S-O-N-A-D-E. -E. You can think of it uh, as a way, it's a play on the, on the term Robinsonade, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N-A-D-E which derives from Robinson Crusoe to describe a type of story that Robinson Crusoe, uh, the Robinson Crusoe type story. In Edison Aid, it comes uh, from the name Thomas Alva Edison, the great inventor. And so this type of story uh, involves usually a very young inventor who, with the help of his technology that he created, often by himself, saves his girl, he saves his country, and he gets rich doing it. So, I mean, you can imagine that the, this, these kind of stories also played into um, the mythos of America as a place that, you know, is a meritocracy, that, uh, that people that have ingenuity and drive and uh, get up and go are able to become, you know, the, the heroes and also make wealth from uh, their successes. So, just to recap that part of uh, today's lecture... Uh, there's five types of stories um, or five types of uh, fictional elements needed to come together for us to have a modern sense of what we think of as science fiction. The first is the fantastic voyage. The second is the utopia. The third is the philosophical tale or what's called the conte philosophique. The fourth is the gothic. And the fifth 
is technological and sociological anticipation, the anticipation that new inventions will arrive uh, and that they will have a great impact uh, on, on society and, and, and for the benefit of, of everyone. Now in this next part of the lecture, I'd like to talk about other notable proto-SF writers. These were people that were writing uh, stories that, uh, you know, one were inspirational to later science fiction writers, but the types of stories that they're writing have some science fictional elements, even though at the time they were writing, we didn't yet have a term for science fiction. Remember, um, the term science fiction as we know it now, there, there are examples going back into the mid-1800s uh, where the term science fiction was used, but that was lost and forgotten. The way we think of science fiction recurred, was rediscovered uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So these people that were writing these kinds of stories didn't have a real word or term yet for what it was they were doing. So the first person that I want you to know about, who you've likely already read some stories by, uh, probably in middle or high school, is Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe. And make sure you know how to spell his name correctly. Uh, it's E-D-G-A-R-A-L-L-A-N. Allen with two A's. Poe, P-O-E. Now, Edgar Allan Poe uh, lived from 1809 to 1849, 1809 to 1849. He's the originator of the horror story and the great detective story. We can trace back to him and the kinds of stories he was writing, both the horror story and the great detective story. That's how important uh, he is to the development of some of the major genres that we think of uh, today in terms of you know science uh, of horror and detective fiction, TV shows, uh, movies, etc. Another way to think about it is there might not have been a Sherlock Holmes without Edgar Allan Poe. Now Edgar Allan Poe, he was also an innovator in psychological realism and poetic form. So I mean he was writing a lot of different things and he was trying to be innovative with the types of things he was writing. He influenced the French symbolist movement uh, this was an important um, uh, literary and artistic movement in France. And in his stories, he melded the scientific with mysticism. So he brought together scientific ideas with mystical ideas, those things that are unexplainable, that are supernatural. He brought these things together. So in that sense, uh, usually his stories... Uh, wouldn't be exactly the same kind of story we think of of science fiction, excuse me, that as in with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So there's two stories that I would just like you to know the names of uh, and that you might read uh, on your own later um, if uh, you have time. You know, if you're like me, I always keep a list of all the things I want to read because I'm always so busy that uh, I don't get a chance to, to get around to it right away. So I keep a good list so that when I do have spare time, I can return to the list and say, okay, I'm going to hit this right now um, and, and read this story. It might involve my research. It might be just something I want to read for fun. Uh, but by keeping that list, I am always have access to new material uh, that I want to either enjoy or study. So these two works I want you to know by Edgar Allan Poe. The first is The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. And the, that main character's name is uh, Arthur, A-R-T-H-U-R, Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, Pym, P-Y-M. The narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. And this was written in 1838. It was published in 1838, rather. And this is a fantastic story involving shipwrecks and sailing to unknown lands. Uh, so it's kind of like an exploration narrative. Some of the things that happens to Arthur Gordon Pym are really fantastic. Um, so it's part fantasy, but also uh, it involves aspects of new exploration, of trying to uh, discover new places. So in that sense, it is um, somewhat scientific. The second story is the facts in the case of M. Valdemar. The Facts 
in the case of M. Valdemar. That's V-A-L-D-E-M-A-R, Monsieur Valdemar. Uh, and this was published in 1845. And this story is about the mesmerism of a person at the point of death. And mesmerism is kind of like putting someone into um, hip, a hypnotic state. This was like early hypnosis. It was known as mesmerism. Uh, mesmerism, it comes to us from uh, Franz Anton Mesmer, M-E-S-M-E-R. He lived from 1734 to 1815, 1734 to 1815. He was an Austrian physician. So, I mean, it, you can see like there's a lot of psychological research, in a sense, historically, that goes back um, to um, what we now think of as Germany, uh, from that area, Austria. Um, so he was an Austrian physician who created a therapeutic technique involving hypnosis, but at that time it was called mesmerism, based on his last name. <laughs> and in the story, um, a, a mesmerizer, someone who can mesmerize others, uh, places this dying person in a trance and it's a very it's almost a horror story because the person in the trance state can't die it's like he's being held to life based on this but he, the dying man understands that you know he has been placed in a very terrible state and so he's begging uh, to be released uh, so that he can just finally go on and die and so when he is immediately, his body like bursts from like putrescence and rotting uh, because even in this state, it's like a part of him has, has been rotting away just as if he had actually already died uh, some time ago. So um, it's a very gruesome story, uh, but Poe has a, a fantastic way of describing these things in the story in a way uh, that gives uh, feeling to the writing, thinking back to Ted Chiang's uh, The Truth of Fact on uh, The Truth of uh, feeling. All right, so that was Edgar Allan Poe. The second writer who I'd like you to know about um, is also another American writer, so you know uh, obviously Edgar Allan Poe is American. Uh, the second writer is Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now you're, you probably have heard of Nathaniel Hawthorne before. You might have read uh, some of his works maybe in high school. Uh, he lived from 1804 to 1864. 1804 to 1864. Uh, and just to spell his name, Nathaniel, N-A-T-H-A-N-I-E-L, last name Hawthorne, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E. Now, with Hawthorne's writing, uh, there's many scientists and inventors in his fiction, including mesmerism and the biological sciences. So one thing I always want to remind you guys to think about is that science fiction isn't just about spaceships and cosmology and astronomy um, and physics. Uh, it's also about um, the biological sciences, about chemistry, uh, about the soft sciences like psychology, sociology. Um, so it involves everything. He also um, used uh, creative and or deployed creative and destructive skills in his fiction. His fantastic events uh, are given a naturalistic explanation. The fantastic events in his stories are given a naturalistic explanation. So it's not just like, you know, a miracle. He puts it in terms of like how this thing might have actually happened. And his fiction is largely a response to the emergence of a technical scientific elite in the United States um, in, in um, the early to mid um, 19th century. Now, there's two uh, stories of his that I would like you to know the names of. And again, you might read these later if you have a chance. The first is The Birthmark. The Birthmark. And it was published in 1843. In the story, a beautiful woman has one blemish, a birthmark in the shape of a hand on her cheek. Her husband obsesses over it and creates a potion to remove it. While successful at removing the birthmark, it ultimately kills the woman. 
So there's this uh, attempt by you know the husband to undo what nature has done. Uh, but as I've heard uh, a number of scientists say, is there's no free lunch in nature, meaning that if you're going to try to do one thing, uh, like physiologically, chemically with the human body, there's going to be a trade-off. It has to be balanced out somehow. And in this case, the, the balancing is unfortunately the, the death of uh, the wife. The second story I'd like you to know about is Rappaccini's daughter. Rappaccini's daughter. And that is, the name is spelled R-A-P-P-A-C-C-I-N-I. Rappaccini's daughter. And this was published in 1844. And in this story, there's a poisonous maiden. There's a woman who has uh, who gains resistance to poisonous plants and becomes poisonous herself in turn. And she dies when the man who desires her gives her an anecdote to her poisonous biochemistry, um, which unfortunately... Uh, causes her death. So again, there's no free lunch in nature. The next person who I'd like you to know who's a very um, significant name in science fiction is the French writer Jules Verne. Jules Verne. Jules Verne, his last name spelled V-E-R-N-E, lived from 1828 to 1905. If you wanted to think of him this way, He's one of the two founding fathers of science fiction. If you want to think of science fiction having a mother, it's definitely, without a doubt, Mary Shelley. But we could say that there's two fathers. And how we might you know, reconcile this, I don't know. That in itself would be a science fictional story. Uh, but many people call Jules Verne one of the two founding fathers of SF. The other being H.G. Wells, who I'll talk about in a minute. Well, Jules Verne... Uh, he, uh, again, was French. He comes from a middle-class family. And he himself says that he was influenced by Edgar Allan Poe. And we know this is, is more, even more true because he wrote a sequel to Poe's story, The Adventures of Arthur Gordon Pym. Because one of the things that's kind of a letdown about Poe's story, The Adventures of Arthur Gordon Pym, is that it ends abruptly. Um, I don't know if... Uh, Poe just ran out of steam. Uh, if he needed to get something published in order to make some money, whatever the reason, it ends rather ab abruptly and he kind of comes up with this very um, uh, loose ending. And so Verne wrote a sequel to it to continue the story, to keep it going along. Now, in Verne's writing, there is an optimism about progress and European man's central role in 19th century culture. There's an optimism about progress and European man's central role in 19th century culture. So what that means is he is pro-expansionist, he is orientalist, meaning that he um, feels that the only way to really understand the Orient, uh, the, uh, the East, is through uh, the European mind. Um, in it, this feeds into ideas of colonization as you know, taking care of other peoples, uh, something you know, obviously uh, that has uh, been jettisoned today as, as, as um, wrong-headed thinking. But at that time, this was something that was very popular, and, and he, his stories uh, support uh, and argue for these types of things. Now, Jules Verne was born and raised in the port of Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S. And one of the things that you'll find is that the sea figures into many of his fictions, probably because of this, this um, location, this environment he grew up in. And the overarching theme in his series of works is known as Voyage Extraordinaires. Voyage Extraordinaires or what we would say in English, extraordinary voyages. So the way you spell that in French, because I would like you to know this in French, is voyages, that's spelled V-O-Y-A-G-E-S, extraordinaires, E-X-T-R-A-O-R-D-I-N-E. 
A-I-R-E-S. And one thing that I would ask you to do is bear with me when I do say things in French because my pronunciation of French is terrible. Uh, just as an anecdote, when I was a student at Georgia Tech and I took three semesters of French, um, usually the students in class would snicker when it was my turn to have to say something during class, uh, during open discussion or during presentation. So uh, I do my best, uh, but unfortunately uh, my pronunciation um, is, um, has much to be desired. Now, continuing with Jules Verne, uh, the Voyage Extraordinaires uh, are near future stories that take existing technologies just beyond what was then realizable. He takes the known and then he improves on it a little bit. And that's how he creates the scientific and technical aspects of his stories. Another neat thing about his fiction is you can learn something about science, technology, geography, and the natural world as it was known then from his books. Uh, but just as a side note, he often uses these things satirically, um, as I'll briefly discuss in just a moment. But when you read his works, there's a, there's a strong didacticism. There's a strong will to instruct, to teach us something in his fictional stories. Now, with Jules Verne, um, there's uh, three major works uh, that I would like you to know about. But he wrote, you know, many more than this. But these are these are three of the really important ones. Uh, the first one I wanted to mention is Journey to the Center of the Earth. Journey to the Center of the Earth. And this was published in 1864. And remember with these stories uh, that they were written in French. Uh, so the they don't always immediately show up uh, in English translation as quickly as, as some popular works might be today, but even then there's, there's so much published around the world that doesn't get translated in English, which is a shame, but um, just, just so you know and keep in mind that the, with these publication dates, these things don't just, pom, immediately show up in English. So with Journey to the Center of the Earth, uh, the adventurers navigate through volcanic tubes that they find that connect different parts of the earth uh, through volcanoes. So the adventurers, they basically go into a volcano in Iceland and then they re-emerge after many adventures uh, walking out of a volcano in Italy. So not it's very light on, on science and, and it was really speculative um, about how um, volcanism and about um, how plate tectonics and all that kind of stuff worked. So this, this particular story hasn't aged as well as some of the others. The second story is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And this was published in 1869 to 1870. 1869 to 1870. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea centers on Captain Nemo and his electric submarine, the Nautilus. Now, one thing that's, that kind of gets lost in that title is that 20,000 leagues is a measure of distance, not of depth. So he's not literally 20,000 leagues under the sea. He travels through the voyages that take place, the adventures that take place in the story, 20,000 leagues. And it means that he's under the water 20,000 leagues, which, you know, at that time was a, a significant accomplishment. So at that time, even this is, you know, 1869, 1870, submarines were well known at that time. Um, but he improves on the idea. Uh, he makes it so they don't leak. He makes it so that they can be submerged for extended periods of time. Uh, things that weren't that well worked out at the time, uh, despite the principle of the submarine being well known and people using it for different um, um, uh, work. Now, some of the characters in the story I want to point out. We have Nemo. Now, Nemo's name uh, comes to us uh, from the Odyssey, from Homer. And it means no man or nobody. And it's the name that Odysseus gives to the Cyclops um, when uh, they're trapped uh, and trying to escape from uh, the Cyclops um, um, cave or residence. 
and he tells the Cyclops that his name is Nemo. And another way of thinking about it is that it means outside community. So Nemo is outside community, and it might be a way that we could think of Victor Frankenstein from Mary Shelley's uh, novel. Another character is Professor Aronnax, A-R-O-N-N-A-X, Professor Aronnax. Now the thing about Professor Aronnax is this is where some of the satire comes in. He always talks about science because, I mean, he's supposed to be a scientist, but he's always wrong. Um, and it's usually other people who have more of a practical sense of the world that are then correct him or say how he's wrong. And then what they say is the right science, the right technical answer. Um, and some of these answers uh, comes from uh, Ned Land. Ned Land is a Canadian harpooner uh, who uses his common sense to make educated guesses that prove correct over Aranax's long-winded lectures. So even though Jules Verne, you know, um, promotes science and technology, he doesn't necessarily say that that what comes from the ivory tower, so to speak, is what's always right. But there's also this practical side to theoretical knowledge. And if you're really interested in Nemo, uh, he does reappear in another story called The Mysterious Island, which was uh, published in 1874. Now, the third uh, and final Jules Verne uh, novel I wanted to mention, um, again, just to kind of dispel some of the associations that have been made about it um, and the way it's been translated into popular culture um, are a little different than the original story. In the original story of Around the World in 80 Days, the, the, the novel's called Around the World in 80 Days, published in 1873, in this work, there were no balloons, as we've seen in some of the film adaptations of this film. All of the travel takes place on the cutting-edge technology of the time, which are steamships and railroads. So steamers and rails are how the travelers try to circumnavigate the globe in only 80 days. So it's really about the wonders of new transportation technologies uh, of that time. All right, so let's continue uh, with the next part of the lecture, which is going to be focused on the writers whose works we've read uh, for today's class. And that'll be H.G. Wells uh, and E.M. Forrester. So H.G. Wells um, lived from 1866 to 1946. 1866 to 1946. And his full name is Herbert George Wells. But you can, you in your responses, give his name as H. Period, G. Period Wells, H.G. Wells. In addition to Jules Verne, H.G. Wells is the other founding father of modern science fiction. Now, unlike Jules Verne, who come from a very solid middle-class family, H.G. Wells came from a working-class family. But because he was so smart, he won a scholarship to the Normal School of Science in London. And while he was at the Normal School of Science, he studied with T.H. Huxley. T.H. Huxley. Huxley, who lived from 1825 to 1895, was a scientific humanist, also known as Darwin's Bulldog. He was the guy that would oh, that staunchly defended with evidence and, and eloquence um, any detractors uh, to Darwinism who came up with irrational explanations. He was a staunch rationalist, he was an empiricist, um, and he would come to defend Darwinism um, in its early days. T.H. Huxley. So H.G. Wells studied under him at the Normal School of Science in London, and that had a significant impact on H.G. Wells' thinking and many of the stories that he wrote throughout his life. 
Now, there's five core themes that I want you to know about H.G. Wells' writing. Five core themes. First, evolution. First one is evolution. The second one is invention, creating inventions. The third is prophecy of change, prophecy of change. Fourth is social extrapolation, social extrapolation. And the fifth is it simultaneously celebrates and cautions us about science and technology. So the core themes again are evolution, invention, prophecy of change, social extrapolation, and it simultaneously celebrates and cautions us about science and technology. So especially with that fifth characteristic, that fifth core theme, you can see how it relates to what I've argued is what represents the best of science fiction are those works that are a little ambiguous, that use tone, that tension between opposite positions to make it possible for the reader to be more involved in the, in the story, to leave it up to us to figure things out, to decide you know, how we should take the celebration and the caution in these stories. Now, H.G. Wells' writing uh, and the writing that you know, was emulated by others uh, based on the work that he did is uh, identified or termed scientific romances. Scientific romances. So before there was a word for science fiction, one way to describe it was the scientific romances. Now, I don't mean romance in the sense of your romance novel that we think of today in its own special section of the bookstore or library. Scientific romances um, were uh, stories that were basically dramatizations that turned on some sort of scientific or technical question. Now, uh, these are some of the elements of scientific romances that I want you to know, and you'll see that they overlap in different ways uh, with what I talked about in terms of H.G. Wells's core themes. So this is the scientific romance. First off, again, Wells exemplified um, what was a scientific romance. Wells exemplified the scientific romance. And in many, in many ways, this was the term for science fiction up until the Second World War. Even though in the United States we had science fiction as a term before the Second World War, over in Britain, scientific romances was still an acceptable term for the genre. The second thing about scientific romances is that they have a long evolutionary perspective. They have a long evolutionary perspective. What that means is that it's not just looking at what's going on here and now or a little bit in the future. It's looking at how things will change over the long history, over many, many years and generations. So a long evolutionary perspective in those stories. Also in these stories, there's an absence of much sense of the frontier. And so again, there's an absence of much sense of the frontier. What we'll see, like uh, for example, in the dime novels I mentioned earlier, usually most of those stories take place in the frontier, meaning going out west, uh, which was, you know, um, the kind of the, the ideal uh, of American expansionism, uh, that you know, we needed to, we had, you know, the, the right to make claim to all of uh, the United States and North America. And so there was this idea of expanding into an unknown frontier uh, and making use of that space. Um, but in the scientific romances of H.G. Wells, there's not much sense of a frontier. The British, their historical and cultural trajectory was far different than the United States. So it's not surprising that the, their concerns and what their emphases were would be different than the United States writers. The fourth thing about scientific romances that you should know 
is that there's usually a faceless or nameless hero or someone who's powerless in the face of natural forces. So a scientific romance has a faceless or nameless hero or someone that's powerless in the face of natural forces. So in, say for example, again, the dime novels, you're going to have that young hero inventor. So you know, it's going to, he's going to have a name, he's going to have a little bit of backstory. Uh, we're going to get to know him a little bit as a character. Whereas in the scientific romances, the individual wasn't as important because th these stories are written about a much, with a much broader perspective on things than just what's going on with one person at one point in time. And then finally, the fifth thing about scientific romances is that they are less hopeful about the future. And in many cases, they're just downright pessimistic. So they're less hopeful about the future and they're pessimistic in, in, in tone. So again, uh, first, Wells exemplified the scientific romance. Second, they have a long evolutionary perspective. Third, there's an absence of much sense of the frontier. Fourth, there's a faceless or nameless hero or one that is powerless in the face of natural forces, meaning that nature is bigger than the individual. Kind of an idea played on by the sublime uh, that we've encountered like with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein uh, and that I mentioned in lecture about romanticism and, and the differences between the beautiful and the sublime. And then fifth, they're less hopeful about the future uh, and they are just downright pessimistic usually. Now there's a few notable works that I want you to be aware of by H.G. Wells. And again, check out some of these if you have an opportunity. Um, Many of these are not incredibly long novels by modern standards, so they won't take you as long to read uh, as, say, a modern science fiction novel, you know, that's like this thick. Uh, they're, much, they're briefer novels, they're to the point, uh, but yet they cover a lot of ground, uh, ideationally and imaginarily, um, than, um, you know, some um, less good science fiction today. So the first notable work I'd like you to know is The Time Machine. The Time Machine. This is from 1895. In the time machine, it introduces the idea of a machine that's capable of moving forward or backward in time. Before H.G. Wells wrote the time machine, there were time travel narratives, but they often involved something that was mysterious or supernatural uh, or someone falling asleep like Rip Van Winkle. Um, you know, devices that you know, had no you know, factual or scientific basis. Whereas in the time machine, we actually, for, for the first time, see a technology that's based on an idea of science that, that figures into it that allows a person to move backward and forward in time. And because you have a machine now that can travel in time, we get to see the characters travel across evolutionary spans of time, where you go many, many years, so you can see how you know, uh, things can change biologically, how things can change over the whole course of the, the world history, rather than just you know, uh, short gaps of time like we see in Robert Zemeckis' uh, Back to the Future trilogy. The second uh, novel that I'd like you to know about by H.G. Wells is The Island of Dr. Moreau. The Island of Dr. Moreau. And that's spelled M-O-R-E-A-U. And this was published in 1896. And this is another work that you might think of uh, in terms of like final uh, paper projects uh, because there's a lot of connections between The Island of Dr. Moreau and Frankenstein. And in The Island of Dr. Moreau, published in 1896, 1896, if I said that wrong a second ago, um, it's about this, this scientist who creates human-like creatures from uh, vivisected animal tissue, meaning that you know, he's taking animals um, and you know, cutting them up and then putting them back together to create more complex creatures that have reasoning ability like human beings. So he's very much like Victor Frankenstein, except he's creating uh, these, these animal-like beings that have the human faculty for reason. 
Um, and this raises lots of questions over uh, you know, what responsibility he has to them, what kind of agency do these creatures have, like what kind of power of choice do they have, uh, etc. So a very complicated novel, a uh, very important novel uh, for thinking about uh, ethical issues relating to science technology, uh, particularly with other life forms. The third novel that I'd like you to know about by H.G. Wells is The Invisible Man, a grotesque romance is its subtitle. The Invisible Man, a grotesque romance. And this is from 1897. I think what you'll begin to see is that he is covering a lot of the major tropes that we think of with science fiction in a very short span of time around the turn of from the 19th to the 20th century. Um, I mean, he's the originator of many of these ideas that we see in these stories that we see repeated again and again in modern science fiction. In The Invisible Man, a scientist devises a way to reduce the body's refractive index to that of air and in thus becoming invisible. Now, his intent is to gain fame and fortune. We're seeing again the, the uh, play of hubris, just like we see with Victor Frankenstein um, in Mary Shelley's novel. Um, there, there's a lot written about, about this novel, particularly about the, the main character, the scientist who invents this ability to become invisible, that you know, he, he's uh, possibly a psychopath, someone that you know, sees others as objects and has no qualms about doing harm to others in order to reach his own, end, his, his own desired ends. So he's a lot worse character um, than Victor Frankenstein, um, but you know, very uh, excessively self-confident uh, and, and not considerate of others. The fourth novel that I'd like you to know about by H.G. Wells is The War of the Worlds. The War of the Worlds. And this was published in 1898. In The War of the Worlds, um, it features a re resource-depleted and grotesque, tentacled, Martian um, civilization. These Martians, they live on Mars. They don't, they've run out of resources there. And so they decide to invade Earth with their mighty tripod walking machines. So you imagine these big metal tripod machines armed with heat rays and chemical weapons coming to Earth to take over. But ultimately what happens is that their lack of immunity to our normal earth bacteria kills them off before they can you know, completely eradicate humanity. Um, you know, this has been remade many times into different movies. Um, and each of those movies that have been made about it have their own cultural context, which is something to consider. Um, like with George Powell's production of War of the Worlds um, in mid-century during the Cold War, has um, depictions of red over everything, uh, which strongly suggests the aliens uh, are, in a sense, um, communists, and they've come to take over, um, which was a, a big concern during mid-century, during the Cold War in the United States and in, in the West in general. Uh, so we can talk about how these different uh, adaptations of stories can change with the cultural and historical context in which that they're you're received. So you have this story, this novel written by Wells in 1898, has you know, very different historical connotations than what we see later on with the film version um, that was made mid-century. Now, um, the last two novels I want to mention before I talk a little bit about the reading for today uh, by H.G. Wells, um, the fifth H.G. Wells' novel that I'd like you to know about is called The First Men in the Moon. The First Men in the Moon from 1901. So in this story, using a newly designed metal called Cavorite, and named after the scientist that, that invented it in the story, um, these two British men are able to use this material, which has the ability to negate the force of gravity to construct a spherical spaceship to fly to the moon. So basically they take, they, have, they build the sphere, place cavorite in different places, 
that is covered by special shutters. And by opening and closing the shutters, they are able to use their anti-gravity force uh, on the sphere to propel it away from the Earth and toward the moon. Now, some of the interesting scientific you know, um, realism of the story is that on the way there, uh, the two British men experienced weightlessness. So you, Wells was thinking about the real science of traveling to the moon way back at the very turn of the 20th century when he wrote this. Uh, now, besides being a travel narrative of these men traveling to the moon, uh, it's also an alien story. So that on the moon, they encounter a different life form that are very insect-like called selenites, S-E-L-E-N-I-T-E-S. -E -E and these selenites uh, are intelligent beings, and, they're, and one of the British uh, men are able to communicate with them eventually. And so there's the issues of like you encountering other civilizations uh, and what can ensue from that. The last novel that I want you to know about by H.G. Wells is called A Modern Utopia. A Modern Utopia from 1905. And I want to mention this one because what we'll find is E.M. Forrester writes his story that you read largely in response to this particular work. So A Modern Utopia from 1905 is a techno-socialist utopia. It's a, a story uh, that's, like, that's um, socialist in nature. Uh, it's, a, it's ruled and governed uh, by technocracy. Um, and it's a utopian. It's like no place, but it's also supposedly a good place for those people that live there. He, and Wells is trying to imagine how science and technology can be harnessed to produce a better world for everybody. And a modern utopia uh, is one of those explorations. He wrote you know, several uh, different types of utopian stories, but this is one of his earlier ones. Interestingly, the action of this novel begins in the Swiss Alps. So another connection uh, in his work to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. If we want to think about Mont Blanc uh, and Camonis, uh, where um, Victor encounters um, his creature and, and receives his story. Now, the assigned reading for today by H.G. Wells is the star. And you, you got all the information about the star uh, in uh, the Wesleyan Reader. So make sure if you haven't got the Wesleyan Reader yet that you get that um, as soon as possible so you can begin reading these stories. Now, you'll notice some things about the story. It's about the passing of a rogue star through our solar system and the terrible ecological effects brought by this wayward star on our planet. So like Kepler's Somnium, which I mentioned in an earlier lecture, we see at the end observations made about the Earth from another point in the solar system, in this case from Mars by the, uh, uh, from Mars by the Martians, who, quote, are very different beings from men, end quote. That's on page 49. We see at the end, uh, Wells allude to the social benefits that come to humanity as a result of our weathering this catastrophe. Finally, the story takes a big perspective. Notice that there is no single hero to thread the story together. Its perspective is cosmic and on the level of the universe. And there's one thing I want you to do. Go to Wikipedia and search for pale blue dot. So go to Wikipedia, do it right now, and search for pale blue dot. What is The article that's going to come up is a photograph of Earth that was made by the spacecraft Voyager 1 from 6 billion kilometers away. And you'll see that Earth is just a tiny dot, just bigger than a pixel on this image. And it's kind of caught in a ray of sunshine. So there's a little bit of glare that Earth is captured in. And this is the perspective that Wells is working from. And he's encouraging us to take in this story that you know, not only in terms of Earth's place in the universe, but also in regard to inspiring greatness for humanity that can come from us working together instead of individualistically. 
because if we kind of put all of our problems, all of our terrestrial problems in perspective from billions of, of kilometers away, then it makes those problems look a lot less significant. That you know, if we work together, maybe we can achieve something far greater than we can alone. Uh, and so this is like his, his, his lesson to us in this story and that many people have carried forward. Uh, also Carl Sagan, who was very instrumental in the, in the taking of the pale blue dot image uh, by convincing the folks at NASA in charge of the Voyager 1 project to have the spacecraft um, do the maneuver necessary to take that photo and to send it back to Earth. Because he knew that it was a, an image that you know, had special significance beyond simply just taking a picture from you know, a selfie of Earth from that far away. All right, so this is gonna be the last bit of lecture. We're a little over an hour now. And this concerns E.M. Forrester, uh, who wrote uh, The Machine Stops. Uh, the other story that you read for Wednesday's class. E.M. Forrester uh, lived from 1879 until 1970. 1879 to 1970. He was a British novelist like Wells, so H.G. Wells and E.M. Forrester are both British, and in E.M. Forrester's works there's a strong theme of humanism and social connection. Strong themes of humanism and social connection. And again, you got Wikipedia open, look up humanism. Get a sense for like what some of these words mean uh, in a little more depth. Uh, only takes you a second, but uh, strong themes of humanism and social connection in E.M. Forster's works. But now E.M. Forster is not, by definition, a science fiction writer. Um, the Machine Stops is really his big claim uh, to some work that is science fictional. His, the majority of his works include issues of class difference. So he's concerned about how uh, there's class differences play a way in the way we interact with one another. Uh, sexuality is a big part of his stories. And there's a lot of symbolism in his stories. Symbolism uh, means that there's like certain meanings attached to the symbols or the images we might encounter in his writing. So like you might see, uh, like for example, uh, a craggy rock or a type of flower or a type of bird, but there's something deeper in the meaning behind that which you can research and discover more meaning from. So again, it kind of gets back to the ideas of association about how our brain works uh, that I was talking about in our last lecture, that these things have associations that if you know what they mean, it gives you access, um, a deeper access to the meaning of the story or how the story is supposed to be making meaning for its audience. But that's not to say that that's the only way to read or understand these works. It's just one of the ways, and it's a way that is intended by the author, which I'll talk more about as we move through the class, doesn't really concern us that much. Even though an author might say, this is what this story means, my response to that is I can give a tinker's cuss. What matters to me is how I receive the story, how other people receive the story. Because once you create a work of fiction, once you create some kind of artifact, whether it be something in writing, a movie, a video game, once it's out in the world, it's really up to the audience to decide what kind of meaning they'd make from it. Because again, we all have a different take on things based on our... Uh, our, our cognition, our associations, our brain wiring, our experiences, all of that. That is what's more important um, than what you know, arbitrarily a writer might say, which even in that sense, we don't have direct access to that person's mind or their brain. Uh, we don't know if that's true. And also, their own interpretations might change over time. Something you, again, connected to uh, some of the things we read in Ted Chiang's uh, The Truth uh, a fact and the truth of feeling. Now there's, a, there's several very important realistic fictions by E.M. Forster that I want you to uh, just be familiar with the names. Uh, again, these are very important 
literary works, so I encourage you to read them, but these are not science fiction works. Um, one of these uh, is called Howard's End. It was published in 1910. Howard's End uh, is about social conve conventions and also about turn-of-the-century interpersonal relationships. Howard's End, 1910. A second important uh, novel is A Room with a View, A Room with a View, from 1908, so just before Howard's End. And A Room, uh, a room with a View is about the personal life of a young woman in Edwardian England. So you have the Victorian era, era then you have the Edwardian era. So this is about the Edwardian era, a lot of social change taking place. And the third work I'd like you to be familiar with is called A Passage to India. A Passage to India. And it was published in 1924. Now, the neat thing about A Passage to India is it does contain the science fictional theme of otherness, about how you're know, one group of people, you know, what happens when they encounter a very different group of people, what we might call otherness. Another way to think about this, if we were to if term it in um, post-colonial theory, um, Edward Said uh, talks about um, this work and others in relation to Occidental views, the Occident meaning the West, and the Oriental meaning the East, uh, and how the Occidentals view and interpret what they see in these eastern places and in these eastern peoples. And so A Passage to India is about the racial tensions between white British colonizers and the indigenous Indians in India. Um, it's a very powerful and moving story. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite novels. I highly recommend it. Uh, but again, it's not science fiction per se. It just has science fictional themes of otherness. And now finally, with what you read for today's class, uh, is E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops. The Machine Stops. And this was published in 1909. The Machine Stops is a response to Wells's techno-social utopias. So like um, a modern utopia, it's in response to that kind of story. It reflects a deep skepticism of human dependence on technology. So while Wells presents us with some tone, with some tension between the positive and negative effects of science and technology, Ian e. Forster comes down very hard in saying science and technology erodes what it means to be human. It takes away from the human experience. It's very bad. So it has a very deep skepticism of human dependence on technology. Now, in addition to Wells' arguments for global cooperation and collaboration, um, he generally argued that the effects of technology on social development could lead to better social arrangements for all. Forster, on the other hand, sees technology as a threat to humanistic values. So you already probably took a look at humanism on on Wikipedia, here again are some of the humanistic values that you should have in mind, namely human agency, or you know, the power to act, the power to have choice, human agency, human values, human empiricism, and human rationalism. Forster extrapolates the technology of the turn of the century and imagines what they would be like in the far future and what effects would they have on people. And from his vision, what we see is a nightmare. Now, to be fair to Wells, Wells himself is not an absolute utopist. He explored the ill effects of technology and evolution gone wrong in some of his writing, perhaps most notably in The Time Machine, which is a warning against the assumption that the Whiggish view of history, remember that from Ted Chiang's uh, The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling, this idea that progress is always going up and up and up and up, that he's warning us that if we just assume that's the case, that if we don't make that the case, if we don't make choices to use these technologies and to use science responsibly, that it can go into a direction we might not intend. 
So he's also coming and saying that human agency has to be at the core of this. That the human choices and the choices for uh, the good of humanity need to be at the center of these things. So Ian e. Forster you know, might not have liked what H.G. Wells had to say, or he may have just focused on the, the, what he saw as the negative aspects of it. Wells was, to be true, uh, looking at the good and the bad. Okay, so that concludes the lecture uh, material for today's class. I, I want you guys to continue the discussion on Twitter. Remember to have your six tweets about the reading and lecture, your two questions, two responses to other people. Try to seek out other people you haven't responded to yet on Twitter. Um, and uh, also, compare the star uh, by Wells and the very different story, The Machine Stops, by Forrester to the definitions of science fiction list. Um, you can use all six of your tweets in relation to that if you want um, to see which ones fit and which ones don't. Um, I'll leave that up to you guys. Um, but keep up with the tweets. I'll try to connect to you guys when I can over the coming week. Um, but I will definitely be back in class uh, with you on Monday, June 2nd. So make sure that you're, for those of you on campus, that you're back in class um, then, uh, where we'll be talking about uh, the pulps and the beginning of the solidification of a science fiction genre. And so for that fourth week, we'll be taking a look at H.P. Lovecraft's The Color Out of Space, uh, which is one of my favorite Lovecraftian science fiction stories, and C.L. Moore's Chamblo, which is in the Wesleyan Reader. And then for Wednesday of the fourth week, uh, we'll be taking a look at the Flash Gordon serials, um, the first episode, The Planet of Peril, from 1936. So we're going to take a look, not just the writing of that time, but we'll begin looking at some of the film versions of science fiction that came out at that time. And I'll have more lecture to describe all those things uh, when we get to the fourth week. Uh, until then, uh, you guys, uh, you know, good luck with all your other work that you have besides ours. Um, and then look for, uh, during uh, the fourth week, also more explanation about the discussion essay, the very first discussion essay, which will be due on Saturday, June 7th, about everything we've covered up to that point. So I'll talk a lot more about that during the fourth week uh, and have like a mini review uh, on Wednesday, June 4th. Uh, so I'll see you guys later. Um, and talk to you then.